Stephanie Kibler, Executive Director here at, I said that fast, Executive you did. Director here at the Fremont County <laughs> Historical Museum Library and Village with Risha Lilienthal, curator at the museum here. And the heckler we have behind the camera would be Aaron, <laughs> our whoa, whoa. <laughs> experience and programs manager. So if you hear loud outbursts, that's who that noise is coming from. Or the area. <laughs> I just did. <laughs> it, it, is, it is Women's History Month, and we are celebrating the women that brought us cocktails yes. all month on cocktail history. So according to Flavier Times, and I had to look up how to pronounce Flavier, oh. make sure I got it right, they say the challenge to celebrating all women's roles in the world of spirits is that our roles have often been undermined. Sure. Women, you said spirits, and I was like, Ooh. Oh, women would often be involved in family distilleries as barmaids or mixologists um, under wraps. So kind of like, didn't want you to know, in order to not be discovered or to draw too much attention to themselves. While in the 18th century, barmaids totally ruled the roost, things changed when a group of men decided a bar was no place for a woman. It didn't stop with ending women's rights to earn a living by serving booze. Women were discouraged from consuming alcohol and shamed for the desire to drink at all. As late as the 1980s, women could be refused from spending their own money in a pub if they were not accompanied by a man. Did you just say 1980s? 1980s. Did you hear that, ladies? 1980s could be refused service. Wow. Now, credit cards, women couldn't get credit cards till the 70s That's without a man's that. signature. But in some places, couldn't order a drink and pay for it themselves into the 1980s. Right? That's kind of what I did. Anyway, who is Betsy Flanagan? Who is Betsy Flanagan? She's considered the mother. Yeah, you didn't take that cue very well. <laughs> she is considered the mother of cocktails. Mm -hmm. uh, Flanagan's story is one of the greatest in cocktail history. That's what they were saying online. Uh, it's good. I don't know if it's the greatest. Uh, one story goes that Betsy would garnish drinks with a cockerel's feather, and thus the word cocktail was born. Whether it was Betsy or not is slightly up for debate, she is, after all, a fictional character. But if it's not her, her character still puts the word firmly in our vocabulary. So one could argue that fictional or not, she's the greatest influence on modern bar as we know it. The cocktail is a global phenomenon. I'm gonna give her cheers. She's a fictional, but yeah, I was disappointed in yeah, that. Yeah, I didn't know she was fictional. Yeah. That's what they're telling me. Look like the green fairy. It's fictional. Yeah. Until you have some absinthe. Yeah. Uh, so today we are mixing the Manhattan. So where did this cocktail get its start? In Manhattan. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so story goes this cocktail was dreamt up at a cocktail party. Okay. Um, In Manhattan. Slightly <laughs> less talked about than her son, Winston Churchill, Jenny Churchill's legacy is larger than we all thought. Jenny threw a party at the Manhattan Club in 1874 to celebrate Samuel J. Tilden's victory in New York's gubernatorial race. Um, it is claimed the Manhattan was born, that Dr. Ian Marshall was said to be the creator, um, and the drink is named because it was held at the Manhattan Club. Oh, okay, yeah, that's However, true. this theory has been called a myth. Oh, because it's contentious again with another theory? During that time, Lady Randolph Churchill was pregnant and was in England and apparently not partying in New York. Oh. Right? 
Um, so in the 1923 book entitled Valentine's Manual of New York, that's a new one for us. Yeah. Uh, presented a more plausible story when it stated that a bartender at New York's Hoffman House by the name of William Elf, Elf, William F. Mulhall, he's got a lot of ooze in there. Yeah. William F. Mulhall recounted during the 1880s that the Manhattan cocktail was invented by a man named Black who kept a place 10 doors below Houston Street on Broadway. The origins of the Manhattan cocktail remain in, in, inconclusive. So whichever story you believe, the Manhattan Club still laid his claim to the ownership. But um, the cocktail goes, the first mention of it goes back to the 1880s. The earliest known written mention is an article published in September in 1882 by the Sunday Morning Herald in Olean, New York. Um, in this article, the ingredients whiskey, vermouth, and bitters were used, as well as the name of the drink were mentioned. Okay. However, other names like Jockey Club Cocktail and Turk Club Cocktail were mentioned, and this adds a bit to the confusion. Neither of those sound good. Well, I'm curious, what, a, what would a jockey club cocktail be? When I think of a jockey, I think of the guy who's riding the horse. I think a jock strap. <laughs> if I could say that. That's, like, that's why I'm like. For the record, jockey club is what the thoroughbreds are all registered through. Exactly. Uh, Kentucky Derby. Not a dirty male's locker room. Strap. Wow. <laughs> Oh man, uh, the first detailed recipe of the Manhattan cocktail was printed two years later in 1884. It was featured in O.H. Byron's book called The Modern Bartender's Guide. Um, as stated in The Modern Bar Bartender's Guide, there's two variants of the Manhattan cocktail. The first had French vermouth, whiskey, Angus, I never say this right. The bitters, the Angus, oh, you know, that yeah. I can never get that out. And three dashes gum syrup, which is um, kind of a simple syrup. But yeah, it sounds kind of, kind of, kind of gross. Speaking of simple syrup, <laughs> um, the second variant was whiskey, vermouth, the bitters, and Caraco, which is orange. Oh, okay. So a little orange liqueur. The recipe morphs a little bit more with Harry Johnson's 1900 Bartender's Manual. And here it had whiskey, vermouth, Caraco, or absinthe, mm. orange bitters, and gum syrup. Is that manual new to us too? Uh, well, I believe we've talked about Harry Johnson I don't know that we've mentioned the 1900 bartender's no, manual. that sounds new to me. Because I feel like the one we talked about is Harry Craddock's bartender's guide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, two new, two new books to read. <laughs> uh, we're going to do Harry Johnson's Manhattan. Yeah. Uh, number one, because we like the idea of the absinthe. Yeah. Um, really, that's why. Yeah. Because we like the idea of the absinthe. Uh-huh. Uh, so, and we're going to use simple syrup and not the gum syrup. Uh, gum syrup, apparently, you can still find. Okay. Um, and it's gum syrup in the U.S. It's actually G-O-O-M-E in... Gumi. Wherever. <laughs> across, Yonder. Across the ocean. Um, some people are of the firm belief, firm belief, that a Manhattan should be stirred and never shaken due to the cocktail foaming. Now, I've only had them shaken, but we're gonna stir ours since that's the way it's supposed to be. Oh, we're not gonna be like Bond. Shaken, that's a martini. Yeah. Um, I was kind of surprised though, you came in my office earlier and asked me about Churchill and it made yeah. me wonder if he had been in Minnesota. Huh. And he has. <gasps> Um, in 1901, um, 
he arrived in Minnesota and he was, uh, he, you know, I'm not really sure. It doesn't really say why he was here. He was an MP at the time. So he was a military police officer at the okay. time. Uh, and it just says that he was here. And then it goes on to talk about where he was born and yada, yada, yada. So not why he was here. Um, one of the men, so then he goes on to talk about him liberating 180 British, British soldiers that were still held prisoner. Um, see, let me go back here. So I'm not, I'm not, um, yeah, I'm just really confused on this, to be honest, y'all. Churchill wrote extensive, extensively of his experiences sending highly detailed letters to his mother who eagerly took responsibility for freeing 180 British soldiers still held prisoner. One of the many liberated that day, Captain Fitzherbert, had been a prisoner since December 15th, just three days after Churchill had escaped. And Fitzherbert was married to a Minneapolis woman, the former Mary O. Olson, who was in Minnesota awaiting her husband's safe return. With a layover in Minneapolis, Churchill again returned to James Young's home. So he came back again, I believe in the forties oh. uh, for dinner and conversation. And joining them that evening was British poet and essayist Richard Le Gallien, Gallien uh, who had spoken in St. Paul the night before on an American lecture tour of his own. Naturally, the focus of their discussion was the death of Victoria and what it would mean to the British empire. Young was certain the empire would soon begin to crumble. Churchill was adamant that nothing of the sort would happen. Mm -hmm. Both took such strong positions on the matter that they agreed to put their money where their mouths were. And Young produced a piece of his stationery from his desk and took out a pen and wrote the following. Mr. James C. Young bets Mr. Winston Churchill 100 pounds, even that within 10 years from this date, the British empire will be substantially reduced by loss in Australia or Canada or India equal to a quarter by population of one of these provinces. In other words, <clears throat> excuse me, that the British crown would lose one quarter of India or of Canada or of Australia before 10 years. Young signed and dated and signed the document. Churchill countersigned it. The Galleon signed as a witness. And as it turned out, Churchill was the more prophetic one that uh -huh. evening. So he won the bet. Well, never know. They don't know if he collected on it. Huh. So that's the Churchill has, was actually has a little connection or two here in Minnesota. Well, maybe they had Manhattan because <coughs> they made the bets in Minnesota. Well, they probably did if his mother was the one who invented it. Yeah. I wonder what Churchill's favorite drink was. I didn't take note of that. Huh. Didn't look for that. Do you want to mix one? Well. <laughs> want to, yeah. Anybody know? Uh, yes. Uh, so, this is a little weird. Uh, Harry Johnson's recipe calls for half wine glass of whiskey, half glass vermouth, dash of absinthe, one to two dashes of orange bitters, one to two dashes of simple syrup. So, do we have something that would be wine glass like? Maybe we can use half a glass of that. Oh, okay. So you're gonna put ice in there first. Please. And it leave room so you can stir. Okay, so I'm doing half, half of this. Half well half vermouth, yep. yeah. sugar on that one, I suppose, huh? Dramatic turning of the bottle. Do you need help? No, nope, I got it. Okay, half, half a glass. Uh, you know, well, that's not quite half a glass. Can I, may yeah. I, may I? That's about half a glass. Okay. Okay. Mark that so you know what you're doing yep. with the next one. <laughs> That's going to fill our shaker. Well, I'm good. we're going to have to split that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and a half a glass then of the whiskey. <clears throat> not quite sure how we're going to do a dash. She's not quite half a glass then either, is she? 
It was too. We're gonna fix this, folks. <laughs> um, this might be tricky. You might wanna use the lid for the Kardashian. shaker just to make sure you don't get absence everywhere. Well, a boof, like a, a plop of it. Isn't that a dash? I can't see it when you're, yeah, that looks good. <laughs> <laughs> a dash of simple syrup. You want me to do the same thing? Well, you can prop that one's not as heavy a bottle. And a couple dashes of the bitters. I feel like we're not organized here today for some reason. Like we're. That's like two drops. Yeah, that's a dash. Yeah. A drop? Two, yes. I did it. You overdid it, did you? <laughs> and now stir it. Gently. Don't make it foamy. Uh, and while you're doing that, there are some very... This is what I deal with <laughs> all day, every day. There are some variations, because I'm used to drinking a perfect Manhattan, um, which is a 50-50 blend of sweet vermouth and dry vermouth. I'm gonna take I'm gonna take that job away from you. <clears throat> uh, the dry Manhattan is just strictly dry vermouth, which that seems a little to me. Um, the Rob Roy Manhattan or Scotch Manhattan um, is Scotch whiskey. You can probably pour that. You wait till you start your bid over there. <laughs> I got a little fight in me this week. <laughs> okay. And we're splitting it? Yes. Yes. You can't drink a whole one of those. You'd be sleeping at the museum. <laughs> That's probably good. Oh, jeez. Yeah, that's probably good. That's a, So you can then chop, chop it off top it off with a cherry and I'm a little afraid I might only have one cherry in here. Well oh no I do I do okay. I have I have more than one. I feel like she's got something to say here. No cheers yeah, cheers. I went out of Manhattan and for oh wait she says Aaron's pouting behind the scenes. No, hold on, hold on, hold on. Jeez. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Long pause. <laughs> My camera didn't pull up. Oh, I like that better than I thought I would. <clears throat> I, 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 was, I really was expecting to not like this version. There's just like a hint of the absinthe. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. like. I put a dash in. Just, I, I just, I, I don't know what I, I I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> I thought it was going to be one of those ones where you take it and then you kind of go, oh, well, okay. The sweet vermouth cuts that okay. bourbon sharp. Yeah. Hmm. I like it. Highly recommend that. That's good. Um, I do really like the, the, um, what, is, what was it called again? The one I like. The perfect one? The perfect Manhattan. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I honestly, See, I, was I haven't had a Manhattan in probably 15 years. Wow. Uh, oh, I, I'm lying. I just had one at <laughs> the 112. Oh, funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one, well, I won't say. This is, oh. This one is better. I think it's you the said it. I think it's the absent. Mm -hmm. I think it's I the like absent. absent. It adds a, a nice kind of richness to. Well, there's just a little bit of herby. Yeah. Herbiness to it then. Mm -hmm. It's good. Yeah, I do like that. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so. Yes. We have bitters in this. Yes, we do. And I feel like we haven't talked about bitters at all. We did a while a back, bit. one of our very first yeah. ones, a little bit. Okay. But since you printed your sheet out on my check I was trying to print today, I did kind of peek at your bitters, because that was on the check. <laughs> it was. 
Um, and we didn't talk about what you're going to talk yeah. about. Yeah. So bitters were founded by Dr. Johann Siegert in 1824. And it was founded um, as aromatic bitters, as medical tinctures to help with stomach issues. Mm -hmm. And then in 1870, his sons um, established them as ingredients for cocktails and food. In what year? 1870. Okay. Yeah. What kind of food, I wonder, would you use bitters in? I don't know. Is yeah. it like... I, I can think of like beer bread, maybe you'd use it in bread. Would that be an interest? I don't know. I don't know. That would be interesting. Yeah. I don't know if it'd be good, but it'd be interesting. <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. And though it was still used as its original use as well, it didn't just like switch over to cocktails. It had also had that medical use um, up through at least 1933 for sure. Um, because we have an example from Freeborn County uh, that we have in our apothecary, which is Lashes Bitters, which is in a brown glass bottle. Oh, it's like about I that remember big. that. We were both excited when yeah, we saw that. because it's really fun. <laughs> on it, it says, um, well, it doesn't say it on it, but it has like a whole like list of kind of like attributes, I guess, to it. Um, but it was an original tonic laxative from 1933. It was known and used for over 40 years it, for um, constipation, biliousness, which is just bile and indigestion. Oh, yep. that's a horrible word. <laughs> biliousness. Ew. It sounds silly, but yeah, it's gross. Uh, indigestion, headaches, and loss of appetite, and anything that kind of arose from imperfect digestion or um, inactive liver and bowels. Okay. So I'm curious, why didn't you run out to the general store and get that to bring in for the... It's really cold outside <laughs> and windy. The four foot snow drift was a deterrent? Yeah, it's almost my height. It is almost your height. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so yes, that was kind of our little bitters in Freeborn County. That we well, that's, I love that. Yeah, it's fun. I, I'm going to just say, yes. we're going to work on finishing up that apothecary yes. shop this year that's new mm -hmm. to us, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's going to be really cool. There's a lot of really, like, <clears throat> things that fell out of use but are really interesting or changed use into something yes. else. It's, re it's yeah, really, really cool. cool. It's really yeah. cool. A lot of glassware, too, it's shaped just, interestingly. It's just in scales, interesting yes. scales. Yeah. It's just, it's things you wouldn't think when you think mm -hmm. apothecary mm -hmm. yeah no i'm excited for that one um but you also mentioned mm -hmm. betsy flanagan which i didn't know she was fake but i had heard about the whole um tale of a rooster kind of deal yeah in the in stirring the drink um so i looked up chickens is that what a cockerel is yeah i didn't know that was a rooster yeah isn't it Miss, okay. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron is not only our programs manager and for an experience manager, she has a day, a degree in animal science. Mm -hmm. So all of our animal questions go to Aaron. Especially if it's <clears throat> poultry focused too. I will say though, <laughs> she needs to get up up to speed on woolly mammoths. I know. Oh yeah. Yeah. But yeah, uh, a young rooster or a rooster that's had his male parts removed. Oh. Well, let's like just say eunuch. let's just say it was a young rooster. Can we? You've already talked about jock so Can we just go oh, no. there? Young uh, rooster. Bitters were used in soups. <coughs> bitters were used in soups and steaks. Steaks <laughs> for the food portion. But anyways, chickens. So I have um, a couple of different things relating to chickens in Freeborn County. So the first one is one that I've mentioned before on cocktail Any, history. Anything on a prairie? Yes. Why? Because you read my my notes. I was trying so hard not to, but they were on the check I tried to print. <laughs> yes, I did put them away after I. I was like, I felt like I was cheating. Yeah, so. <laughs> I did put them away. The first one I have is one that I did mention when we did Dark and Stormy. Mm. So it was the um, the Manchester Storm of yep. 1952. I still just it's such a funny image to me 
that we have a photo of um, a farm, which is east of Manchester, right after that storm blew through and like destroyed a lot of things. There's a, a, destroyed, bu a destroyed building um, to the left of a silo and this white chicken is just hanging out in the, in the photo. It, it, it almost like he's the only thing that survived yeah. the storm. He's just like- Or she. Yeah. But the, the feathers are like the tails all up and I don't know. It's just, it, it tickles unique. my fancy. I don't know. I like it. <laughs> it's, um, another um, thing that I found in the 1911 book that we have on Freeborn County is Emma oh. Peterson in 1897 married a Mr. Nelson and they had what was listed they they were listed as raising fancy chickens fancy chickens um, they raised partridge wide nets okay and silver lace wide nets why not huh? why not why not i why like net? silver lace that yeah. sounds like a fun chicken yeah but they yeah they raised Fancy, fancy chickens. chickens. I'd yeah. like to raise fancy chickens. Yeah. I'd love to have a little chicken coop in my backyard. Mm -hmm. Pretty little chickens. Maybe some pretty little eggs. Yeah. I'd like chickens too. Yeah. Especially with them. the price of eggs. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and then the other kind of little grouping I have related to Freeborn County is that we have in our collection a doll that uh, was from a Dakota family that were called Prairie Chicken. Oh. If you translate it into <clears> English, <throat> they were called Prairie Chicken. And they gave uh, Hazel, a little girl named Hazel, which they called her Little Rain Shine. I love that. Um, they gave her a little doll um, because they were living in Albert Lee in 1919. And Hazel's father, who was an A.C. Leaper, was his name, he apparently helped them in some way. That's how it was listed. I'm sorry, when you said he was an AC Leaper. <laughs> His name um, was I, AC. I was picturing, oh, okay. I was trying to figure out what AC was, what he was leaping <laughs> over. Uh, <clears throat> oh, um, no, he, his name was I gotcha. AC I get Leaper. caught up to that. Uh, um, and he had apparently helped um, prairie chicken family <clears throat> and their like gratitude was giving her a little doll that they made Aww. which that's a thing that we have in the one we have on exhibit yeah, right on it's, exhibit. it's it's um I don't want to call it cute it's not cute it's it's there's something just kind of heartwarming about it and I didn't know sure. the story yeah it's just something a little it's a, it's sweet. Mm -hmm. When you see it, you think, oh, that's really a sweet doll. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Something that she kept and then ended up giving to us. Nice. Yeah. Um, little rain shine. Little rain shine is what they called her. Yeah. Isn't People that cute? always think I'm a little rain shine. Yeah. Never. No. <laughs> and um, it, it's kind of interesting that they were they were called prairie chicken because if you look that up in the 1911 book that we have, um, there's a whole thing about prairie chickens. So prairie chickens were found in great numbers in this area before uh, white settlers came. But so were they free roaming chickens? Mm -hmm, they were just wild prairie chickens. Interesting. And uh, they were found in such great numbers they were um, ended up being destructive to the grain that farmers had been planting. So they weren't like quail or anything. They were chickens. They were chickens. They were prairie chickens. <clears throat> Interesting. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the farmers would destroy um, nests or hunt them. And they, um, a quote that is in the book says, it was nothing uncommon for the sportsmen to bag from three to five dozen a day. Holy cow! Uh, they came into the fields in large flocks, and when suddenly frightened, their many wings sounded like distant thunder. Interesting. Mm -hmm. By 1911, they had become virtually extinct in the area. Because they were catching how many dozen a day? Five, three to five. Holy cow. Yeah. So they would eat them, I'm assuming. I would I hope would they hope would so. eat them. Yeah. How many chickens can you eat, though? You get five dozen chickens a day for a week. Hopefully they're giving them away or 
Yeah. Man. Yeah. Oh, I wish we had prairie chickens. Yeah. Most people are like, I don't want any chickens roaming around on my prairie. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't very Minnesotan, was it? <laughs> that was kind of a rough cowboy. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm going to apologize right now because um, this week has been just a whirlwind week. Mm -hmm. And in all honesty, um, part of my silliness is that I am going on vacation and taking yeah. a full week for the first time since I started. I've oh, never taken a full, a full week. week's yeah, vacation. That's true. So I'm a little... Anyway. That just means that you trust us. I do trust you, finally. <laughs> Sorry. Well, you know, we didn't, who needed a vacation during COVID? You couldn't go anywhere. Yeah. And you were stuck home for yeah. half of it. So you didn't need to take one then. And usually when I go, I go see my sisters, who I love dearly, but a full seven days can be a little long. So I usually take a shorter trip. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, full week. Uh, anyway, the Manhattan is one of the world's most recognized Camp cocktails, blah, 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 blah. appearing in films and TV series across the globe, Ooh. from Bond to uh, Sex in the City. Okay. Um, I wish there was a good movie quote that I could, you know, oh. cheers you the last time with, but yeah. to prairie chickens. <laughs> to prairie chickens. 